He was one of the last captured Plains Indians to be returned home. Herman Lehman, the son of German immigrants, was kidnapped by the Apache and cruelly abused until he became one of them. The record of Herman Lehman is really important to understand American Indians. The world was astonished at his adventures. He had risen to the position of a minor chief. He asserts himself in a world that is characterized by violence. It has some tragedy and some great fascination to it. The freedom of the Plains Indians was at stake because of the advancement of the white settlers. Herman Lehman becomes a witness of their downfall and fights until the end for the Indian way of life. He became Indian uh, in even some ways more than the Indians were. As I sat here thinking about Grandpa, this was the actual place he was returned. And I just wish he could be here and I could sit beside him and listen to some of his stories that he would tell me. In 1878, at first just a rumor, an Indian who was seen at the Indian reservation is in reality a white person, a German Herman Lehman. His mother, Augusta, never gave up her hope to see him again, but nobody really knows if it is truly him. When he was kidnapped, he was still a young boy who spoke mainly German, just like anybody else. For the young warrior, everything at this place seems to be foreign and threatening to him. Is this the son who was robbed from Augusta Lehman eight years ago? Back then, Augusta, her husband, and the kids ran a little farm. It was not an easy life. Almost no rain, the soil was hard. Here, life means hard work so that the family will be able to make it through the winter. In 1846, Augusta Lehman came with many other immigrants on a ship from Bremen to Texas. Starvation and persecution pressured people to leave their old homeland. They were full of hope for a new beginning in a country with equal chances for everyone. At the beginning of the 19th century, they moved to areas on the East Coast, especially the German Triangle between Milwaukee, St. Louis, and Cincinnati. Fifty years later, the East and the South are completely settled. The Germans discover Texas as a new destination. But during their trip, many of them fall victim to disease. Conditions are worse than promised. Only the tough survive. In the middle of Texas, they established the town of Fredericksburg. Here today, many of the residents are descendants of German immigrants, just like the writer Scott Zeck. His great, great, great uncle was also kidnapped by the Indians. The Germans had purchased rights to settle in the Fisher-Miller land grant. So there was going to be a direct conflict between the German immigrants and the Comanches who hunted there. In 1847, the German immigrants were able to make a private agreement to share the territory with the Comanches. That was very unusual in American history for a group of private settlers to reach an agreement with a Native American tribe. 
and for several years it worked very well. But around 1870 the peace began to crumble. Comanche and Apache invade again and again the land of the German settlers. The Indians are not just about capturing their horses. The settlers live in constant fear of Indian attacks and kidnappings. In May of 1870, this becomes the Lehman family's fate. For the families of the kidnapped child, the situation was very difficult. First of all, the families lived many miles apart, so they could not go to anyone quickly for help. And so many of these families spent several years wondering if their child was being tortured, was being starved, was being mistreated. Herman is only 10 years old and he is scared. The Indians put the boy through tests to see his character. Herman proves himself to be tough. Even the smallest pressure caused a part to carve into my flesh. I was able to survive that horrible night. I don't know. Herman's tormentors are Mescalero Apache. They belong to the tribes that were in control of the plains for more than 200 years. The Great Plains, endless grassy plains and often desert landscapes that are hostile to life. Down south in Texas, there is a place with great importance for the plains Indians, the Palo Duro Canyon. Even at the time as Columbus discovered America, there were already settlements at this canyon. Donald Fixico has intensely researched the history of his ancestors, the North American Indians. The Apaches lived in the Palo Duro Canyon. They were a, were a part of the uh, Plains Indian community. Originally they were farmers and they learned to adjust to the earth or to the land and then becoming successful farmers, then all of that was interrupted with the introduction of the horse. It may be hard for you to imagine Indians without horses, but it was not until the Spanish came in the 16th century that they brought horses into this country. The Mustangs are descendants of these Spanish horses. Apache and Comanche developed into excellent riders and became the rulers of the plains. Battles with the whites and between other tribes are their daily routine. Life centered around hunting grounds, horses, and fame. The amount of death in Indian wars really depleted the warriors. Among the Comanches, about 40% of their population was not Comanche. It was Indians from other tribes, it was Mexicans, it was white Americans, uh, people from Texas that were incorporated and brought in and they were somewhat Indianized. Herman and his captors had already been traveling for four days. For Herman, hunger and thirst blend with despair. Escape is completely out of the question. I knew I would never make it back to my home. Wolves, cats, or other beasts would tear me. Only when looking back, Herman saw his life as a great adventure. At 60 years of age, he dictated those adventures and described valuable details about the lives of Indians. For example, how they communicate. The chief had a mirror made out of metal, whereby he reflected the sun. Also, the spies had a mirror. In this way, they could communicate with each other and indicate what the post was How is it to live a life as a white Indian? Enthnologist Marin Trenk studies the history of those border crossers between the cultures. 
Entführung weißer Kinder, die haben immer große Aufmerksamkeit. Kidnappers of white children always cause a great disturbance. And in the case of Herman Lehmann, we have that story. One of adventure and at the same time an account that tells us about two different worlds with different cultures. Of course, the sensational and the spectacular play a key role in it as well. Even today, readers all around the world devour Herman's adventurous stories about life with real Indians. It inspires movies, novels, and even a comic book. It was the first buffalo I have ever seen. They cut a piece of liver out of the still warm animal, sprinkled it with gall, and commanded me to eat it. I swallowed it, but it came up again. I swallowed it again, but it came up again and again and again. The Indians put more gall on the Rami and force me to eat it. Several days before, I was still a part of a loving family, and suddenly, no hope of rescue and the feeling that each moment could be the last one. Force me. After ten days, they finally arrived at their village. Herman should be punished for the fate of the fallen and wounded of their war party. But it isn't all about revenge. The Indians also want to find out if the child could be useful to them. Depending on how he reacts to their treatment, he might get the chance to be accepted into their tribe. The children seem to know intuitively that they should not cry or show fear because they might be mistreated or even killed. And so uh, they, they learn to adjust very quickly. Herman was put to the test, and one of the things they put before him was raw meat and cooked meat. He suspects that perhaps his future fate depends on this decision. taken the roasted meat, the food of the whites, they probably would have tortured me to death. After having been tormented and tortured, he suddenly gains acceptance and approval. For Herman, the door is now open for his first steps into the unknown world of the Plains Indians. This rare film also gives us a unique insight about Indian life. The tribes of the Plains Indians are rarely greater than 200 people and have clear gender roles. The Indian societies of the Southern Plains had a very strict division of responsibilities. Women's activities and men's activities were completely separated. Men were not supposed to do any household work. They were only responsible for the areas of hunting and war. They live as nomads, always looking for the best opportunities to hunt and to rob. They are able to build up and take down their teepees in less than an hour. Very few of the Native Americans lived in stone buildings. The Anasazi Indians lived in little multi-story dwellings, but most of them used wooden buildings or tents. These great cultures have left behind almost no marks in 10,000 years. They orally pass on their history and their myths. Almost all of them don't know how to write. The scenery in North America is extremely diverse, just as all the cultures of Indians have developed differently. There are 567 different tribes. It's a very complex um, uh, community of native people. And they're so diverse, uh, it's like a, a history of the world because there are Comanches and Mohawks and uh, Senecas and all over the entire Americas.
The Blackfoot are hunters and nomads. The Seminole live in huts and engage in agriculture. The Kiowa are settled traders. In spite of this variety, most of us have a very one-sided view of Indians, just as the one of the Apache Winnetou, who is always noble, helpful, and good, or on the other hand, of the wild and evil Indian. Both of these views are only stereotypes. Nothing that Carl May writes is historically accurate concerning the Apache tribes. They developed their own way of life that was not so much centered on war as it was on plundering. They became professional marauders. We can see that fact very clearly in Herman Lehmann's book. It was not about killing as many people as possible, like in military actions, but it is about plunder. Plundering animals, people and possessions. Herman was socialized into exactly that pattern. Herman was trained to become a warrior. There is no connection to his old home anymore. Supposedly his whole family was killed during another attack. This was a lie of the chief Carnaviste that would permanently bind Herman to the tribe. Weil Kano Wist mich geraubt hat, war ich sein Besitz. Er nannte mich seinen Sohn und gab mir den indianischen Namen Enda, weißer Junge. A new name, a new family, new challenges. Herman more and more encounters the world of the Indians. Compared to his new life, his former life was uneventful and full of hardships. This is the type of house the Lehman family had. These log cabins were very typical in the Texas Hill Country up until the early 1870s. It was very hard for families to survive in these conditions. The houses were very hot in the summer, they had to cook outdoors, they were cold in the winter, and very little space. By 1920, five million Germans had emigrated from Germany to the United States. But dreams fall and break into a thousand pieces in bleak landscapes as it was in Texas. Often there was less land than promised. The soil was very hard to work. Additionally, there were problems that no one had thought of in Germany, such as the continual danger of Indian attacks. In the years before 1870, in the borderland of Texas, almost every German settler knew about relatives who had been kidnapped. The kidnapping of children in the rural areas of Texas were fairly common. We don't know for sure how many were kidnapped, but almost every year or two in a rural community, at least one child would be taken. Jimmy McKinn was kidnapped at 10 years of age by the Apache, and he learned their language. He defended himself vigorously when he was rescued. Olivia Oatman is 13 years of age when she was kidnapped. She lived among Indians for six years. She had to live with her tribal tattoo the rest of her life. Some of the kidnapped children, white and Mexican, were returned to their parents after negotiations. My ancestor, Adolf Korn, was captured five months before Herman Lemo. He was traded to Comanches for horses and blankets. Um, in Herman's case, he stayed with the Apaches, but in this period in time, the Apaches and Comanches would sometimes camp together. And so my ancestor Adolf Korn and Herman Lehman occasionally met each other and could converse in German. At home, uncertainty remains. Over a period of years, Herman's mother Augusta doesn't know if Herman is still alive. Herman's memories of the past are dried up. His family doesn't exist for him anymore. In the past four years, he became a real Indian in how he feels, how he thinks, and how he behaves.
For a period of weeks, the warriors leave their camp and go on raids throughout large areas of Texas. Whoever opposes them runs into danger of being killed, whether they are a settler, soldier, or Indian. Whereas the children of settlers learn how to become carpenters or blacksmiths, Herman's curriculum ranges from stealing to murder. Never before I have scalped anybody, and neither it was my desire to do so. But Carnivesti threatened me with all kinds of punishment. I would refuse to do it. When white Americans come into Apache land, the idea of killing them became uh, what people did uh, in fighting for their own lives. And so in the process of that, uh, a, a lot of intimidation and a lot of uh, mutilation of bodies and, and scalping and uh, amputating parts and, and things like that, uh, to show the other side, you don't come here because this is our land, this is our Apache land. If it's the Comanches, then this is Apache land, and you don't come onto that land because this is what will happen to you. Their motive is not lust of murder, it is about deterrence. In certain parts of the world, scalping can be traced all the way back to the distant past. In many tribes, it became prevalent after the clashes with the whites became more and more brutal, just as it was in the case of the Plains Indians. Herman had achieved the status as a young but equal warrior with promising young talent. And if his personal history among the Apache would have taken a different course, he would have almost certainly become a chief among the Indians. This was the way that was predetermined for him, and he could have carried it. But since the middle of the 19th century, settlers advanced further and further into the plains. In order to protect against Indian raids, forts were built that served as military bases. The battle between whites and Indians became more and more intense. On both sides, at horrible raids, whole villages were extinguished. The Plains Indians suffered huge losses because of war, but also through diseases they were exposed to because of the whites, such as smallpox and cholera. In 1867, once again, hope for peace is springing up. More than 5,000 Plains Indians gather at Medicine Lodge to negotiate with the whites. At that time, it was a real media event. The government made them an offer, provision of food on their own reservation, if they stopped their raids and they agreed to the building of the railroad. Many of the Southern Plains Indians knew that they couldn't keep living their old way of life. Most of them, at this point, had already accepted that life on a reservation was inevitable. And that was the solution the Americans offered them. Seven years later, Carnaviste and his people, including Herman, refused to go onto the reservations, along with many other Plains Indians. They wanted to live just as their ancestors, as warriors and free nomads. But how could they hunt in a world with increasingly more barbed wire fences? Cattle barons, the military and settlers, all of them wanted to force out the Plains Indians. And there was a very special troop that was most effective. The Texas Rangers actually fought against the Indians harder than the U.S. Army in some cases. And so both the Indians and their captives who had become adopted very much hated the Texas Rangers and considered them their strongest enemies. Their methods were mutilation, torture, and scalping. In the style of a guerrilla troop, they defeated the Indians with their own weapons. In 1874, when Herman Lehman came in contact with a band of Texas Rangers, he was a part of a raiding party that came down near Fredericksburg. 
and uh, they, they had hurt, gotten word that the Texas Rangers were coming, so they headed out to the hill. The Indians run into an ambush. Most of them were able to flee, but Carnaviste's brother was fatally shot. Herman was seriously injured. I shut my eyes. I could already feel the bullet in my head. But I suddenly realized that the Rangers didn't do anything to me because they recognized that I'm white. The Apache, however, had regarded him as one of their own for a long time. For five days, they waited for his return in vain. Then they began with the mourning ceremony. The record of Herman Lehman is really important to understand American Indians being a very inclusive people. As harsh as they first treated him, they made him to become one of them, and in the end, he wanted to be one of them. Injured, without food, and almost without water, Herman dragged himself back, driven by the longing for his tribe. To me, uh, as a historian, but also as an American Indian who is a historian, he shows that American Indians are real people. He shows that they have need for a community and for a family. I told Carnavesti of his brother's death, that I had buried him with my last ounce of strength in order to protect him from the wild animals. Because of his courage, Carnaviste appointed Herman as leader of his own little troop. Five years before, Herman was just a little, fearful German boy. Now he is a war hero and probably soon a husband. Later on in his life, he could become a chief. But the world of the whites is unstoppable and spreading. The railroad is now reaching as far as the Great Plains. It was not only bringing new settlers and cattle breeders in this area, but buffalo hunters also. Within only two years, they killed five million animals on the Southern Plains. In the 1870s, the systematic eradication of buffalo begins. The American government tolerates it. The American military desires it because in that way they can destroy the livelihood of the Indian tribes as the buffalo is the livelihood and the spiritual center of the society. The vision of a medicine man gives, once again, hope to the warriors. If they would just kill enough whites, he prophesies, the buffalo will return again. More than 700 previously enemy warriors of the tribes of the Comanche, Kiowa, Cheyenne and Arapaho join forces united through one feared chief, the Comanche Juana Parker. The target of their attack in June 1874 was Adobe Wall, a little post of the buffalo hunters in Texas. In the Panhandle Plains Museum, no one knows the history better than the historian Michael Grauer. The buffalo slaughter really begins after the Civil War and certainly flowing by uh, the early 1870s. Most of the rifles used by buffalo hunters were in fact military surplus. Uh, converted for hunting rifles until the Sharps Company comes out with their uh, 50 caliber, uh, sometimes referred to as Old Reliable or the Big 50, and it becomes a very uh, much treasured rifle amongst buffalo hunters because of its killing power from a great distance and its efficiency. It's a deadly superweapon, not only for hunting buffalo but also for the battle with Indians. 
In the Battle of Adobe Walls, a superpower of several hundred warriors attacks the huts of the buffalo hunters. Only if the whites are able to keep them at a distance do they have a chance. There were 28 buffalo hunters here. They were supremely armed, especially with Sharp's Big 50. And Billy Dixon, allegedly on the second or third day of the battle, shot an Indian off his horse from about seven-eighths of a mile, which is a record shot. Shocked by the range of the weapons, the Indians pulled back after three days. More than 700 warriors were unable to defeat 28 buffalo hunters. The news of the defeat at Adobe Walls pierced us to the heart because now it was very clear to us that the buffalo hunters would come in such great numbers so that no hunting grounds would be left for the natives. Would be left for natives. Herman and his tribe pull further and further back into the mountains, desperately looking for land where the whites would not come. They found a valley where they could survive. There was water and wild game for hunting. But then Herman makes a discovery that ruins all plans, gold. In the world of the whites, it would be the solution to all their problems. But for Carnaviste, the nuggets are worthless stones and a threat for the freedom of his people. The chief knows about the disastrous magic that gold has for the whites, and he had heard what happened during the gold fever in California. In the middle of the 19th century, in one dash, Hundreds of thousands traveled to the west coast. The natives were enslaved to become workers for the gold diggers or they were killed. In only five years, their numbers decreased from 150,000 to 30,000. We buried all our hope that we would eventually discover land that the whites wouldn't find. So, with increasing frequency, the government systematically deploys soldiers against the Plains Indians. They would force them finally into the reservations. In the middle of the 1870s, the last great battles start in the Great Plains. Famous leaders of the Plains Indians, one more time, stake everything on one card. The Comanche Quanah Parker, the Sioux Sitting Bull, and the Kiowa Lone Wolf. They lead their warriors into the last great battles of the plains, at the Washita River and Red River, and then at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. There, the Plains Indians achieved the greatest victory of their history. But every single time, the army joins forces and repulses. Quanah Parker is cornered. With his people, he pulls back into the Palo Duro Canyon in November 1874. Here they know every single gorge and are able to avoid open combat. Back in this direction on the other side of that ridge is where the Indian camp was. Uh, they felt they were safe because they were used to U.S. Army tactics of retreating in the winter. However, Colonel McKenzie uh, brings his troopers down the south rim of the canyon, basic, basically undetected, and, and surrounds the village that's here, several hundred lodges stretching miles down the river and uh, burned the lodges, burned the winter food supply, captured the horses and put them on foot. The soldiers pushed the horses into the Thule Canyon, which was about 30 miles southwest of it. There they kill the horses, way more than 1,000 of them. The massacre at the foot of the canyon lasts more than half a day. With the loss of their horses, the horse people of the Comanche lose their soul. A, a legend sprang up that the, the ghosts of those horses who were killed, ghosts of horses and mules, 
um, would roam the plains and run across the plains out here, especially during a full moon in the, in the later part of the year called the Comanche moon. Even to this day, the fallen men and horses are commemorated. In the spring of 1875, Quanta Parker and his men surrendered. The only solution for them is to permanently go onto the reservation. Herman would have also gone with his Apache tribe, but then everything was completely turned upside down. During a dispute, Carnaviste was shot dead by another Indian. Herman didn't hesitate for a moment to revenge his foster father. Then Herman had to flee himself so that he wouldn't be killed. For months, Herman lived in the wilderness. Here I was, separated from the Indians and fearful of the whites. All alone, without friends, without acquaintances, or even enemies who I could talk to. He is one of the last free Plains Indians. Only a few Comanches still live outside of the reservation. After a year, I was tired of my lonely life. Although, I didn't know if the Apache or the Comanche were at war right now. I had to try my luck. Any circumstance he was in, uh, he made the best of it. I think the years that he lived by himself was probably the hardest years for him. Uh, he was so lonely, it was just him and the horse. And so he took his life in his hand when he went back into the Comanche uh, powwow. Suddenly, his eventful history resumes. He was accepted into the tribe. Now, once again, he is able to live the life of a warrior as a Comanche. He is in the front line in the last battle between the Plains Indians and the Whites. The army in return destroys the camp of the Comanches. Driven by raging anger, the Indians' goal was to kill at least five Whites for each of their victims, when all of a sudden their former greatest leader, Quanta Parker, appears. The warrior in Lehman uh, continues, and then uh, Quanta Parker, the great war leader himself, says, you know, we shouldn't fight anymore because if we're going to survive as a people, as Comanche people, then we need to accept this new kind of lifestyle. And he had to convince Lehman to do that. The pressure from the flow of settlers became too big. Together with the last free Comanche, Herman goes to the reservation at Fort Sill. Most of them live in the open country in teepees but they have lost what was once typical for them. Hunting and, of course, raids are forbidden. The life they once knew is no more. Only Chief Quanta Parker assimilated into the world of the Whites and became a kind of foster father to Herman. For almost two years, Herman lived with him on the reservation until he was eventually recognized as a white among the Indians. As the army brought him back, he was very frightened. He didn't know what was going on. But Quanta Parker encouraged him to come. Kawana told me that my family was still alive and that I should go home. I told him that the Indians were my family, that I would not go home with the whites. But when he got back and his brothers and sisters came out and began to talk with him, uh, he began to realize uh, that Willie was his brother and Mina was his sister. His sister hadn't seen him for eight years, what seemed like an eternity, but a scar on his hand gives her assurance. Slowly but surely, the fog lifted in my memory. It became clear to me that I had found my family, 
but I was an Indian and I do not like them because they were pale faces. Herman's neighbors and his family thought that he would be very relieved to be home. They assumed that he had been beaten and tortured and mistreated for eight years. What they did not know was that he had risen to the position of a minor chief and was very happy in his life as an adopted Apache and later Comanche. With some difficulty, he learned German and English again. Repeatedly, he escaped from the world of the whites, ate raw meat, and slept under the open sky. It's uh, the greatest Indian captive story. I've tried to find out all the information that I possibly can. Uh, and I realized how tough life must have been because he could not assimilate back into the white man's ways and yet the Indians' ways were gone. Again and again, he visits the Comanche at the reservation. Occasionally, he tries to live there because in his heart, he stays one of them. Don't think that the Comanche are bad people, only because their side of the story has never been written down. For me, they are always my most loyal friends. Twice Herman was married. With his second wife, they had five children. Both of his marriages failed. Also, his career attempts in the world of the whites were not very successful. His performance in Wild West shows, however, are legendary. He impresses people with his skills in the art of writing, as well as with his shooting, and of course with his stories. Herman Lehman died in Loyal Valley in 1932, two years before his grandson Wayne was born. I am a white man, born in 59. My name is Herman Lehman, from the Mason County line. I was captured by Carne Visti, an Apache chief so brave. With my little brother Willie, we became Indian slaves. Willie was a boy of eight, he managed to get free. I was just eleven, a different fate awaited me. I was beaten, tortured, starved, and shamed, so moon will never heal. I became an Indian warrior, in my heart I'll always feel. They tied me naked to a bucking horse to survive, I had to win. Fed me guts and sour milk, burn hold in my skin. Ran a string of rawhide through my ears, the scars are there today. I learned to hate the white man and live muscularo away. From the Guadalupe range to the hills of Mexico From the Llano Estacado to where the Pecos River flows We stole the white man's horses, cut his throat and scalped his head Burned his home to the ground and left his family dead Well I remember the Battle of Concho Plains in 1875 the rangers killed us one by one, I escaped and survived. Victorio and Geronimo set fire to our last breath. For the life of the Indian who was about to meet his death. Then a medicine man killed Carne Visti, my chief was put to rest. I avenged his death with my bow and three arrows in his breast. I had to leave the Apache tribe, their heart had filled with hate. When I took the life of a shaman, I had sealed my fate. So I spent a year in 
little hiding with the wolves I did sleep. I lived a life of solitude in the canyon wall so steep. The be a lonely hunted man began to take its toll. The aching in my Indian heart filled up my soul and I joined the Comanches. Matachima became my name. Kotapa was my brother and always will remain. Juana Parker adopted me. I became his son, but the plight of all Indians had only just begun. Now we fought the tribe of Tonkaways, and they were the devil's beast. Never smoked a peace pipe on our palace, and they did beast. They ran like evil rabbit dogs in a bloodthirsty pack. We burned their bodies one and all, and never once looked back. We killed the buffalo hunters and tried to save our land. The time had come for the Indian nation to make our last stand. Quanah Parker led the way to Fort Griffin, we didn't go. We laid down our rifles, our arrows, and our bow. The white man was a poison to the land of my birth. He stole the hide of the buffalo and raped our mother earth. The battle now was in my heart, all memory had been lost. Should I stay a warrior brave with my life as the cause? And they took me down to Fredericksburg to choose wrong from right. I felt I was an Indian, not a man that's white. Nine years had passed so slowly I had to see my home But my heart was still an Indian The only life I'd ever known I returned to Loyal Valley My home from whence I came I remembered Brother Willie And recognized my name My family woven a net of love Around this captured child The grace of God helped restore savage so wild. Well, in the endless battle that I fought as a red man or a white has left a hole in my heart there is no wrong or right. There's only one creator that redeems us all from sin. No one can judge a man by the color of his skin. So I became white and civilized, thankful to survive. Through the years I have five kids and damn too many wives. I never betrayed my Indian heart or my people's pride. I remain Comanche until the day that I died. I am a white man, I died in 32. My name is Monto Chema, there's one thing that is true. Beneath my mountain death I lay. Where my life did start, but the pathway to my Texas home ran through my heart.